This is the Cubism Room at the Scottish National Gallery of Modern Art. It's one of my favourite rooms, in fact. Uh, cubism is quite a difficult art to understand. I, I think a lot of people would look at it brown, a bit difficult, might just walk on. Don't, don't. These are some of the most revolutionary, exciting new works. This is a high point in Western culture. So for nearly 500 years, we've got single point perspective, which really involves a one-eyed person looking out of a window. It's all done with maths, and you've got a fixed point. So here we've got George Braque, French artist, born in 1882, and Pablo Picasso, 1881 in Spain. Two artists who forged this Cubist style, which completely revolutionized the visual arts. Uh, they turned over 500 years of tradition. And they did it by accepting that you've got two eyes. If you look through one eye and the other eye, you'll see a slightly different version of things and you move around things. So here we've got a still life with scissors, bobbin, various things, and they're sort of cut up to imply that an artist has actually moved around it. With Picasso's work as well, not only is he doing that, but he's using different techniques. He's using uh, a sort of realist technique here um, to paint this bottle. He's painting the bottle from the side, and then he's painting the top from above. Painted some white paint, and then in the wet paint, he's scratched a glass with the back of the brush. Here he's using a paint that's normally used for sheds. Some of it, he's just leaving pure pencil or charcoal. So it's as if he's saying that not only can you approach your subject from a number of different angles, but that you can do it in a number of different techniques. It's totally revolutionary. It has an effect on architecture, poetry, literature, cutting things up, reshaping them, doing them again. Over here we've got works by Metzinger, who was one of the, he was called a salon cubist, a rather derogatory term, but Picasso and Braque didn't show their works at the regular major exhibitions in Paris. This all happens in Paris. Metzinger is one of their first followers who does, and he becomes very well known for a more uh, sort of polite kind of cubism, if you like. As does Delaunay. Uh, Robert Delaunay, uh, again, he sees the um, initiative that's been made by Braque and Picasso, and he brings a new spin to it, particularly in terms of colour. He calls these works simultanist, which really means that he's incorporating things that might have happened at different times of the day or different times of the month or year into one single painting. So it's incorporating that idea of time, and he's also doing it in this highly coloured way. It shows a group of French and Welsh rugby players jumping for throw-in. Rugby is a very modern subject at this time. It's not something you sort of watch on TV. Uh, this is a new biplane that would be very, very new at this time. And it was made by this firm called Astra. And this is the Eiffel Tower. Again, it's new. It's made in the 1880s. Still hasn't been up in Paris for very long. And here we've got Delaunay's name, which is rather cleverly and humorously incorporated into the hoarding behind the rugby players. This is by Louis Bob Popova, a woman artist who comes to Paris and studies with Metzinger in 1912. She immediately understands Cubism and takes it into a slightly different um, path. Very Russian. The Russians were interested in the idea of particularly abstraction. They didn't want any, anything to do with old-fashioned, sort of pre-revolutionary art. They wanted to make an art sort of from scratch. Start with a tabula rasa and uh, make everything anew. And that's what Popova is doing in this extraordinary picture. There are a few sculptors who got involved with the Cubist movement. If you think about it, it's an unusual thing to do. If, if Cubist painting, like we've seen here, is really about trying to translate a three-dimensional experience onto a flat two-dimensional plane, sculpture doesn't really need to. It's already three-dimensional. It's almost as if they've taken a three-dimensional world, put it onto two dimensions, and he's folding it back out into a three-dimensional sculpture. But it's a fabulous thing. You'd only notice it's a figure if you just saw around here the little eye. Once you realise that's an eye, you know, that's the head, this has got to be the body, legs and so on down here. And it's done with this beautiful um, texture. This would have been created in clay, and then sent off to 
a bronze caster, uh, and they'd make the bronze out of it. It's like probably a unique bronze. We'll talk a little bit now about Sonidolone. This is actually earlier. It's called The Prose of the Trans-Siberian Express, and it's 1913. This is actually a book. If that was folded together in concertina fashion, it sort of flips nicely within that little wallet at the top. It's a poem by a friend of hers called Blaise Sendrans about making a train trip from Vladivostok to Paris. I think there are 400 lines and it's done in 12 different typefaces. Coming straight out of the Cubist style that um, Picasso and Braque have developed, but giving it this um, idea to do with memory and also intense colour. Sometimes this is called orphism. And over here, there's an extraordinary painting by Fernand Leger, who, used, who was very friendly with Picasso and Braque, one of the great second wave of Cubists. His spin on Cubism is associated with the machine. He was often called a Tubist, which I think is a rather nice uh, um, sort of ism, a Tubism, um, a kind of joke, but it stuck. Uh, and he, he was in love with the machine. He thought the machine was going to liberate everyone from household drudgery, the wars would finish, and the, the machine would solve everyone's problems. A really utopian thing, which is the same with Popova, uh, sort of by banishing uh, figurative references, you're sort of joining the workers and um, marching on to a glorious new future. Um, but mistaken he may have been in terms of uh, his glory of the machine, it's certainly a glorious painting. <laughs>